Once upon a time, a friend told me that I'm just a German masquerading as a Slav. I didn't believe him then, seeing as I was beating his ass in Heroes of Might and Magic 3 at the time, but apparently he had a fucking point, and I just hadn't had the chance to unlock the Germanic side of my genes. Because I hadn't played any settler derived games before. Well, until now, I guess. Hi, my name's Lagger, and Against the Storm is the latest in the endless parade of indie city builders that have been all the rage since Spanish decided that the genre shouldn't just be a German national export. It's warm, it's calm, it's not quite family friendly, and not only does it carry all the complexity one expects from a city builder like this, but it goes above and beyond and solves some of the core issues that have plagued this genre since its inception, with a casual ease which, frankly, the people over at Paradox, who are currently busy making the sequel nobody asked for actually run, should take some inspiration from, rather than bundling yet more DLC together. As this game was not developed by a major corporation, but instead by five dudes living on the shores of the Baltic, rather than the issue being money, in Against the Storm the big enemy is instead the weather. The world of Against the Storm is one where the weather has gotten so bad there is no longer storms, but just the one big one which rolls through the world, leveling everything in its path every few years. The rain itself never lets up anymore, and after some genius precursors accidentally released what can only be described as a fuck huge amount of magic into the atmosphere, the very rain now crackles with energy. The resource shortages and mutations that the magic rain caused and led to a civil war, and in the aftermath, most of civilization is gone. Only the smoldering city survives, ruled over by the Scorched Queen, kept safe from the storm under a magical barrier. Except, the shortages didn't stop there. Faced with the inability to procure the resources necessary to survive near the city, the Queen has designated Viserois to settle the wilderness and produce all the city needs to keep itself together. Self-sustaining settlements producing all the food and construction material to keep the Queen's rule assured spring up in the endless forest that surrounds the city, only to be washed away by the storm a few short years into their existence. You are one such Viceroy, and the Queen wants return on the investment that was your training. It's time to get busy. Your job is to establish settlements in the wilds, complete orders from the Crown and survive out there long enough for the settlements to successfully convince the Queen you're worth her time. Weather and the lack of support from back home be damned. That would be difficult enough. But to make matters worse, not only is the bureaucracy that keeps the smoldering city running making it difficult to even get the blueprints necessary to complete the Queen's requests, the divides between the individual races are big enough that the settlements actually start running smoother when you employ segregation. On top of that, the forest itself seems to be looking for ways to make you go away, and as you become more and more of an intrusion, its hostility will grow bringing increasingly worse problems into the mix. On the flip side, however, the Outlands do actually have the resources needed to survive, and though the Crown's bureaucracy presents a stern facade, if you're willing to grease the wheels with something valuable, the envoys will make things go your way. It's just a matter of what you manage to find out there and whether you can make it work for you. After all, in life, the danger is always proportional to the opportunity. In order to keep oneself in the Queen's good graces, all you need to do is grow your reputation. Whether you do that by fulfilling her orders, contradictory and nonsensical as they may be, by making the settlers in your little village comfortable enough for them to do the talking on your behalf, or by sending home valuables pilfered from your surroundings is a choice you take only on the fly, based on the whims of fate. After all, you don't always know what the Queen's going to demand you deliver next, or which species needs you're going to have to deal with. All the while, with each passing day, the Queen's impatience rises, and should you fail to deliver in time, her lovely little bureaucratic apparatus has the power to tell you to go right the fuck back home, instead of continuing whatever doom venture you were knee-deep in. That very same bureaucratic apparatus is, unfortunately, also in charge of the supply line coming from back home. Not only does that mean it'll only recognize you as worth supporting if you keep delivering, it also means that even when it seemingly gives you choices, the Queen's Heralds are actually full of shit. They just picked which boons or schematics for buildings to offer you at random, and if you don't like that, your options are to either cope and seethe, or resort to aggressive lobbying. To the eternal dismay of everyone involved in that system, it also manages your tasks. 
So once the envoy in charge of orders for your settlement decides to hand your farming focused settlement a choice between an order for construction materials and an order to improve the local trade routes, you're going to be branching out whether you like it or not. At least the yearly supply of warm bodies is steady, though whether they're warm bodies you actually want is a question of its own, as there is no guarantee they'll be of a particular species. Fantasy racism is the backbone of the Queen's rule, and for good reason. The preferences of the five races are different enough that their comfort meters go up in segregated housing. The humans make for excellent farmers and enjoy returning to their Germanic roots with alcohol making. Beavers are specialists in woodworking of all sorts, who, entirely too relatably, prefer socializing with machines to socializing with other living beings. Harpies are masters of herbalism and medicine, but as all nurses, more comfortable not doing their jobs and knitting instead. Lizards are proficient butchers who have, unfortunately, not mastered warm-bloodedness and therefore demand to work next to warm objects. And foxes are fragile, rain-loving mutants whose attunement to the storm makes them the best candidates for being fed into the meat grinder of scouting the ever more hostile outlets. Fulfilling the basic needs of everyone is one thing. A roof overhead and scavenged food in their belly will stop most villagers from immediately bailing on you. But long-term contentment, the kind necessary to convince the queen you might be worth some extra resources and time, that's not earned with the basics. Each species has its own list of needs, and while on occasion they overlap, more often than not you'll be stuck figuring out how to keep at least one of the species happy enough to earn you some goodwill. While, not unlike in a democracy, the happiness of everyone else matters only insofar as to keep them from leaving. Generally, needs can be split into three categories. All settlers need housing, part of the bonus from which they gain from having a house, and part of which they gain from enacting segregation. Pretty much everyone is a picky eater once you graduate from eating whatever raw food you collect. For example, only the beavers, harpies, and humans eat biscuits, which lizards and foxes find disgusting because it's not still moving and or bleeding when it's served. Similarly, harpies and humans cannot stomach pickled food and will make every effort to starve to death rather than consume it. Services are an even trickier game. Where recipes for complex foods require only some raw food and maybe some resources, at most the milling of grain into flour, services, as a rule, require at least three production steps, followed by a dedicated building necessary for anyone to make use of them. And even here, one size won't fit all. Where humans find common ground with lizards on going to church, they certainly won't find common ground on beating the shit out of each other for fun. Plus, the kind of beer they enjoy is considered downright plebeian by the beavers, who instead prefer a bottle of wine and an engineering textbook. Weirder still, unlike the other three, lizards and foxes are natural nudists and therefore won't appreciate or use coats, even if they're made available to them. Luckily, if you find yourself having trouble reaching the thresholds to actually start raising your reputation, you can always resort to the ace up your sleeve, making the racism institutional. With a system of consumption control to make sure only specific species can actually gain access to certain types of foods and services, you can make sure those pesky humans don't eat all of the biscuits before the superior beaver haplotype has their go at them. And if that's not enough, there is even a handy button to make your chosen superior species official, which will bump up their happiness by a whole five points at the measly cost of making all those other, lesser beings unhappy. Of course, not quite as unhappy as the forest and rain can make them. As the seasons turn, the storm intensifies and wanes again, and at its peak, it's going to make your life unbearably difficult. The hostility of the forest will materialize as a direct hit to your settler's morale, and with each extra level, things are going to get worse. In some areas, the rain might force your settlers to first eat a bag full of Doritos, and then go to work with fingers greasy enough the trees they cut down end up slipping through their fingers. At other times, anyone without a government-mandated tea ceremony might end up dying of auditory hallucinations. To fight the storm, your only choice is to try and provide the villagers with all the things necessary to delay those effects, hopefully keeping them happy enough to offset the inevitable drop in morale. In case you have surplus fuel, you can also sacrifice it to make things less painful in yourself and drop the hostility. Except that's fuel you might need, and shit the hearth itself go out because of that, neither the queen or the settlers will be particularly forgiving. Trying to produce enough advanced food and services with a shortage of people to man the production buildings or not enough resources to construct those buildings is a constant issue, one that gets worse with each storm season. But after all is said and done, and the painful few minutes of heavy rainfall are over, things do let up. For a time. 
During the other two seasons, things get quite a bit easier. In Drizzle, the forest might even grace you with a few boons as new arrivals come to replenish what you've lost over the storm, followed closely by the Queen's envoys and the few traders with enough suicidal tendencies to operate out here. This is the time to start working on whatever expansion projects you have, to plant new crops and generally try to unfuck all the mistakes the last storm exposed in your settlement's design. Clearance is, on the other hand, meant for finishing up whatever you started in Drizzle. Harvesting plans, completing objectives, preparing supplies for the storm ahead. If it's got to get done, the season switching to clearance means it's got to get done now. Because in a few more minutes, the rain's gonna put a damper on it. And the rain puts a lot of dampers on a lot of things. It's magical, overloaded with energy, borderline dangerous, and immensely useful. Collected rainwater is not only crucial in several recipes, it's also a resource of its own. Provided you're willing to invest in it, the machinery that runs most of your settlement can be fed with rainwater to increase efficiency. The production time you can save this way is a blessing, but one you're going to be paying for. Because as it turns out, the rainwater isn't just full of magic. It's also full of blight rot spores. Buildings that use it will eventually develop cysts that need to be addressed, and the only correct way of addressing blight rot is with fire. The extra production may buy you resources, but during the storm, when the damn things finally bloom to charge up from the rain, all that manpower and effort will need to suddenly be shunted into blight fighters, handheld flamethrowers, and a mad dash to burn the corruption out before it infects the hearth. And yes, it can do that. In fact, it's actively going to try, and the process of getting the equipment to handle it is going to be yet another supply chain to keep track of, at least for long enough to get the job done. Puzzling out what resources you have available and how to turn them into something that will give you enough reputation to convince the Queen to fund your next doomed expedition is the core of what Against the Storm is about. Building and completing a settlement in this game is an effort that will take no more than two hours of your life, but during that time you'll have to figure out the mechanics all over again. Where one playstyle can be extremely effective in the Scarlet Orchard, with your primary residence being foxes, the very same might just crash and burn when applied with beavers in the Royal Woodlands. A simple map effect like no farming can, on a high enough difficulty, entirely invalidate the use of humans in that particular run. On the other hand, without their ability to produce extra from fields, it's difficult to complete a run in which you rely on farms to feed you. Foxes are an excellent choice if you're going to be using caches to generate your reputation, but you can't really do that without a solid source of metal to make their tools from, and they're not exactly good at that part of the production chain. So without having a beaver minority to run the tool shops and mines, what good is that strategy really? Never mind the fact they don't share many vices with the beavers at all, so keeping them both happy is a near impossibility. And that balance of random chance versus player choice remains a constant throughout every layer of the game. As a roguelite, the game's overall does evolve with your progress, at least in terms of gaining access to new tools to bring in your suicide runs, letting you a little farther from the city with each cycle survived. Get far enough, complete enough settlements, and you might even get a chance at closing a seal, permanently buying yourself more time in all following cycles to reach the next one. But beware the ever-growing difficulty. The farther you are from the Queen's protective magic, the longer and more brutal storm seasons get, and the city has no need of you if you cannot keep your delivery steady. There is an elegance in how Eremite Games applies random chance to what is, at least mechanically, a very simple contribution to a three decades old genre, and a huge design lesson to all roguelites in how they temper it with player choice. And that might just be the reason I've managed to play a hundred hours of this without going any more insane than I already was. Honestly, there has to be more to that than some crypto-German genes, because I couldn't stomach playing gothic for more than 30 minutes at a time. Plus, the game doesn't actually look or sound half bad where Paradox decided to go all in on 16 times the detail until the game started pre-rendering half a million virtual sets of teeth in some misguided attempt at realism, Against the Storm has a consistent, direct, dark fantasy aesthetic. One that doesn't fear echoing that different building designs are a result of species divides, that twisted things lurk outside the smoldering city, or that sacrifice of the common man is a daily event not even worthy of the Queen's attention. Supported by an original soundtrack written by a dude who understood the assignment to perfection, the atmosphere cyclically becomes calming during the warm seasons, letting you wonder about the mysteries of the forest and calmly go about building your settlement, only to ratchet up the tension as soon as the storm strikes, leaving you to scramble to handle all the arising issues before the whole expedition falls apart. 
So this Steam Christmas sale, instead of buying the big important city builder everyone's going to be complaining about for the foreseeable future, I'm just going to chill here, having fun with this little jam instead. And none of you can stop me. Because mine actually fucking runs.